All right, so yeah, the title of my presentation is Pal Rising, How One Reservoir is Calling Much Into Question. And like I said, the basically the end takeaway is there are a lot of questions that we still have, and it's important to engage in dialogue to come up with solutions, because these aren't the questions that you can answer in a quick conversation. So Utah Division of Wildlife Resources has partnered with the National Park Service and Arizona Game and Fish to implement uh, the largest invasive mussel containment program in the country at Lake Powell since 2013. Again, containment, we're focusing on making sure no mussels are leaving the area, but also no standing water on board any of these watercraft. Up until 2018, we felt like we had a pretty good handle on everything, and then in 2018, we first started noticing floating mussels in the water column. Uh, we hadn't seen that before, and over the next couple weeks, we routinely started seeing, uh, right here, mussels show up in sea strainers and boats all over the state of Utah. I think over the course of maybe six or seven weeks, we had over 150 boats throughout Utah quarantined at one point or another. Um, so thank God for law enforcement and Scott Dale Bowdy's over there so you can, you can shake his hand. I know he'd appreciate that. Um, so basically what this amounted to was we had to figure out how to confront this with the protocols we currently had. We, we didn't, the protocols were not addressing this, and so we had to revamp those on the fly, but through ramping up our inspection effort, you would see lines like this, where people were having to wait multiple hours just to have their boat inspected so they could leave. If they wanted a decontamination, at some point they were, they were in line for five, six, seven, eight hours not the great customer service we would like to provide, so we knew that something had to change. We figured out a strategy, we went into triage mode, uh, and we got through the season. So, we felt like, you know, we got through it, but we have a couple things we need to figure out. Mussels were floating in the water column. If they could be sucked into sea strainers that were going into engine systems, could they be sucked into ballast tanks? Well, if so, could they actually remain alive in those tanks? We partnered with the Bureau of Reclamation and the National Park Service to design a study looking at just that. And yes, adult mussels can be sucked into ballast tanks through these pumps, and yes, they can survive going through those pumps if they are smaller in size. So anything less than 10 millimeters pretty much survived intact. That was kind of our holy crap moment. Lake Powell 2019. Lake Powell does not cease to continue to surprise us. Again, we started seeing floating mussels in the water column. As the waters came up, they knocked all these mussels that were attached to the walls off into the water. Unfortunately, a picture like this over here is a picture of a marina area. So you can imagine every boat that's being retrieved out of that marina area is passing through this soup of mussels and these mussels cling on. They don't attach by bizzle threads, but they attach and cling on to this boat as it's being pulled out of the water. So at one time, we had probably 60 or 70% of the boats pulling out down lake. They had mussels on them in some fashion or another. Before this year, we, had, we would have decontaminated every one of those boats, but this is Lake Powell, where you might see six, seven, 800 boats come off of one ramp in one day trying to decontaminate 300 of those? Yeah, good luck. So we went into triage mode again. We went from decontamination more towards muscle removal, making sure that those boats at least weren't leaving with muscles on board. But you can see right here, our workload certainly did not decrease. Right here in the blue, you have uh, the number of inspections that are being done. And again, this is in conjunction with National Park Service and Arizona Game and Fish. But we're pushing almost 100,000 inspections just at Lake Powell this year. So a significant workload. Again, we're you know, almost up to 4,500 decontaminations. We've almost maxed our de or matched our decontamination load from last year, yet we've probably sprayed mussels off of, I don't even know how many boats at this point, thousand, couple thousand? Um, so the work is definitely not decreasing. 
We also had a new observation here where we saw non-motorized watercraft pull out with mussels on them as well. Again, we didn't feel like these were a high risk, but when a canoe or a kayak shows up at one of your inspection stations and there are mussels on there, you tend to take notice and maybe reevaluate. So after this season, we have uh, a few other questions and th items for consideration. And again, just to, I don't have any answers to these, but these are things we need to think about and st start to wrestle with. First one, is it appropriate to exclude non-motorized watercraft from AIS regulations? In some of the Western states, they've taken the approach that non-motorized are a low enough risk that maybe we don't need to continue looking at those. I have to admit in Utah, we talked about that at one point, but based on what we're seeing now, no way. We want to continue looking at those boats and we want to make that legally required. Second one, and this gets back to our favorite issue of eDNA. What effect does the decontamination process have on eDNA on watercraft? Is that process actually effective at removing any DNA? If we are worried about eDNA showing up in our early detection monitoring, we at least better want to make sure that that decontamination process that we're heavily reliant upon is actually removing that DNA in the first place. Third, when is it appropriate to focus our, to, or to switch our focus from muscles on board to viable versus non-viable? Non Lake Powell, we made a huge deal as early as, as recent as two years ago. If a, if a boat pulled out with muscles, it was a game changer. Well, now we have to reevaluate it and say, did it pull out with live muscles or muscle fragments, muscle shells? We're continuing to ask those same questions down the highway at our inspection stations. At some point, we have to switch our focus from muscles on board to whether there's actually a biological risk. Whenever, where is that and when is that appropriate? I don't know. It's probably going to vary state to state, but I know that we've kind of already surpassed that point in Utah. Okay, another thing. A couple of years ago, we talked about automated data entry. And, you know, how cool would it be to not have to stick our technicians out there contacting every boat, collecting all this information all the time, a lot of the same information? Well, based on those numbers I just showed you at Lake Powell, that's no longer something that we consider a luxury. That's something we need, and we need it now. Technology's already out there. there are, the private sector's figured out how to do this, whether it's through an easy pass in a carpool lane, or FedEx, you know, uh, through the mail system, or whether it's scanning a QR code or a, a boarding pass when you're boarding a plane. All these things exist. We just need to figure out what components of these current systems are most appropriate for what we're trying to do and figure out a way to mesh those into something that can feed into the database that most of us are already using. How important is this at Lake Powell? One day at Wall Wheat Marina, July 5th this year, we did 443 inspections on this one ramp. Let's just suppose we saved 30 seconds per per uh, data record going into that. That saves us 222 minutes or almost three and three quarters hours just in data collection. That's on one ramp and we're covering five ramps on that one day. So if we save 30 seconds entering that data over the course of six, eight months, you're talking several seasonal technician positions. This is incredibly important. Is there a better way to decontaminate boats? When you're talking about decontaminating 40, 50, 60 boats in one day at one location, filling those ballast tanks with 100 gallons of water every single ballast tank, well, that's not real sustainable. There's got to be a better way. We need to figure out a way to engage the private sector to help us figure this out, whether that's through STEAM, which is being proposed by the Water Sports Industry Association, or whether that's through a dip tank, like we're trying to partner with the BOR to try and figure out if this is actually an effective way. We think it is, but we want to we wanna prove it before we go all in. And funding continues to be something we all harp on. How can we collectively continue to fund operations that only have to expand in the future? You know, this, this 
this challenge is not going away. Boating is increasing uh, nationwide. There are gonna be mo more boaters on the land landscape in 10 years than there are now. We can barely keep pace right now. What is that gonna look like in five or 10 years? How do we continue to fund those operations? Maybe we need to start looking at decontamination fees. Maybe the boater needs to help pay for some of these when, they, when that boat requires a decontamination. What's the role of private industry in this in providing those services? Do we create a market for them to compete and to, to drive those prices down? You know, the user pay, user benefit model seems to work in a lot of cases. Right now, we're in a kind of a, a world where we believe in blanket fees. Is that the most appropriate approach? Or maybe we should target those people that are actually requiring more of our work and attention. Finally, how, is, how much redundancy is appropriate? Again, my view on this has completely changed over the last couple of years. You know, when you talked about a, a, a watercraft going down the highway being inspected two, three, four, or five times, I think a lot of us back then said, you know what, maybe that's kind of a waste of time. Maybe we're hassling that bow there too much and it's not necessary. What we're seeing at Lake Powell is those boats that pull out probably need four, five, six sets of eyes on those because we all miss things and they're pulling out sometimes with dozens and dozens of muscles in areas that are incredibly hard to even access. So where is that redundancy appropriate and where is it not? So in summary, our current model, at least in Utah, is unsustainable, and I would say that's probably the case for a lot of what we do at, at these greater scales, especially when you're talking about containment. We need to engage the private industry and figure out how to utilize new technologies for automated data entry uh, and decontamination. And then we need to start looking at alternate funding models because the funding needs are, are going to continue to grow and I don't think that fees are gonna be able to keep pace with that need. Thank you. Well, since Nate asked you all those questions, who's got answers? Just a question, at the beginning you mentioned that you guys partnered, I think it was with BOR, looking at um, if adults and um, villagers are viable in the ballast tanks, and you said yeah. yes under the 10 millimeters. Do you have a time, did you guys look at how, for how long they can remain viable in the ballast tanks for the villagers? Uh, we actually, we weren't looking at time for the villagers. The, the original intent of that study was to look at villagers passing through pumps. Uh, when we started seeing adults in those sea strainers and those raw water filters, that's when we threw in looking at adults and seeing what the viability of, uh, of adults was going through. So we didn't look at the time component. I think that's something that we've talked about, including in a follow-up study. We were mostly just concerned of whether they're immediately viable mostly because a lot of the boats we see at Lake Powell, they immediately launch somewhere else in Utah within one day's time. So we can look at days and days out, but really we're looking at what's the immediate viability of that because that's what we have to go off of. Good question. Nate? Yes, Bob. Um, thanks very much. Um, it sure is good to be retired. <laughs> um, question for you, um, uh, on the whole concept of um, putting your emphasis on boats that have viable muscles as opposed to non-viable muscles, have you given any consideration on how you would do that evaluation at the boat ramp to see if it's a viable muscle or not? We have thought about that and I'm looking for advice from people much smarter than myself, like the Bureau of Reclamation folks and those people, because uh, there are ways to do that. And uh, as far as I know, there aren't very many Western states that are actually doing that on site though. Uh, so we're interested in that. For the most part, up to this point, we've, we've determined viability by whether we could actually see tissue within that muscle or whether we would tap it and it would close up. 
Um, so it, it's kind of been a crude way to, to determine it on site, but um, we definitely need to go there because, again, we, we are in triage mode and we need to dedicate our focus on the ones that are actually providing a, or representing a biological threat. So we're open to suggestions on that front. If you haven't already, I'd suggest you reach out to Bob McMahon because I know he's looked at this some. Awesome. We will. Thank you. Hey, Nate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so something that I've been thinking about this for a while, limited entry. So to go down the Colorado River, they only do so many permits. To go elk, elk hunting in Montana, they only have so many permits. If we're having that much trouble at those ramps, you get 200 a day. 200 people a day can go in, then you're done. You thought about that? We but that, have, would be a, that would be a Park Service call, I guess. Sorry to bring it up, Mark. But, <laughs> you know, the more I think about it, if you're so overwhelmed, what we do in other natural resources, the fishing industry, we do this all the time, is that there will be so many boats out there, I'm going to go, we're going to reduce the number of permits as a management technique. So just a thought. <laughs> so, yeah, we, first of all, yeah, thanks for the comments, Steve, and we have talked about that. That's br been brought up in, within our AIS task force community, uh, whether that's restricting access, uh, potentially closing down ramps. Obviously, that's a National Park Service call, and they've been, they've been at least open to that, to that dialogue, but that's, that's a big lift. Uh, in Utah, we are exploring options for trying to uh, institute launch fees at infested waters. Uh, we feel like that's a direction we want to go in, but it's the logistics and complications of that are, uh, they're definitely extensive. So we're just starting to delve into that. Um, but again, it, a lot of these places, uh, multiple agencies involved, so it, it requires dialogue and collaboration. And so we're just starting down that road. They're not simple conversations, but yeah, great input. Hey, Nate, going back to the viability of the mussels, and we're talking about the floating mussels, has anybody done any studies? You know, Dr. Dan Malloy did this scientific study, sinker or swimmers, and you put them in a glass of water. If they sink, they're viable. If they, if they float, they're not. Has anybody done anything at Lake Powell as to doing the research about these floating mussels? Because I know it's created a, a panic at Lake Powell. We haven't, as far as I know, none of us have done research on that front. I can tell you that the floating mussel, not many, but we had several cases of those floating mussels showing up in those raw water strainers last year that were in fact alive. So the, the thought that if it's floating, it must be dead, that's not accurate. I would say most of them are, but there are definitely live mussels floating. Always. <laughs> so, um, so resurrecting a, an idea, I know Stephen will really like this, the uh, regional passport. So you're t I'm going to kill you, Alan. <laughs> so you, wanna, you want them to be able to carry something that they can scan, right? So wouldn't, w doesn't that fit into a regional passport issue that they can sign on to this database? They're, they're, Wherever they go, they have one number. They can show it to any inspection station. They can be scanned for that number. They know what's happening. They can track the information. It's also beneficial, could be beneficial to the boater to be knowing, oh, I'm going to go to Lake Powell. I've got some issues there. So it can, be, it can help on both ways here. I, yes, we're definitely open to that. I think you know, the app that we've been pitching within the, the Western Invasive Species Coordinator community, it's essentially that. The, the, the problem is we need to come up with a system that can be readily adopted by multiple states. So that regional scale, it will do us no good to adopt something in Utah that our surrounding states won't adopt because we have Bear Lake that we share with Idaho. We have Flaming Gorge that we share with, with Wyoming. We have Lake Powell that, I mean, ev a boat from every state goes there at some point in multiple countries. So. We're not, we're not looking at small scale solutions. We're looking at the, at the biggest scale we possibly can. And a passport system, if that's something that the other states would go along with, 
we're definitely open to that conversation and I think it feeds in nicely with what we've been talking about in this, this app. Uh, I'll volunteer Stephen to make that happen. Thanks, I, I already did. I have a question. So you mentioned the word triage a lot, but I just wonder, I mean, are you trying to rank or prioritize some of what you presented there, or are you just trying to do it all at the same time? <laughs> it's, well, yeah, so, and again, Scott and law enforcement, they were kind of in the thick of it and instrumental in getting us through this year, including Daniel, our interdiction specialist, who if you haven't met, go meet Daniel, because he's a rock star. Um, yeah, we were, we were forced into a situation where, by statute, we had to make sure no boats were transporting mussels away from Lake Powell. The problem is we had hundreds of boats pulling out with mussels every day at Lake Powell, and we had to try and figure out, one, can we afford to continue to inspect all these? Two, if so, how do we remove the mussels? And three, is decontamination even an option right now? And if it's not, what can we provide down the road as a decontamination option for these people? Because the last thing we want is hundreds of boats that require decontamination headed all over the state, relying on a decontamination happening at those reservoirs. Because those reservoirs are not equipped to handle dozens and dozens of decontaminations in a single day. They're just not. Lake Powell's our only place where we can actually do something like that. So. Uh, Honestly, the hardest part was drilling it into our folks on the ramps that they couldn't do everything because they continued to feel like the pressure of the world was upon their, their shoulders. So we had people almost killing themselves, literally, to try and inspect every boat and decontaminate every boat, and we finally just had to pull them back. Uh, and based on the fluctuating water levels, we think that's probably gonna be the case every year now, unfortunately. RFID chips are used for trucks and vehicles that go in like a, a, a lane that's uh, specialized across the country. What if there is a way to have a sticker that generated revenue for the state that had an RFID reader tied to that boat number? Then this way, the local uh, inspectors could also check in to see where that boat was last very easily and efficiently because it's a passive way to get all their information instantly. Um, and that way, they generate revenue, but also have a compliance piece to understand what treatment hierarchy that that watercraft would need to do prior to entry or exit. Mm -hmm. Is this good? Good comment. We've definitely considered RFID in Utah. We've been talking about that for three years now. Uh, a few reasons why we went away from it. One. It's gonna it's gonna be a hard thing for multiple states to adopt. Um, Anything you start talk, anytime you start talking about putting something physical on a boat to allow you to track it, people get very worried. Um, there are privacy issues, and getting most of the West to adopt something like that would be a very tough sell. Two, we're mostly concerned about not only entering data, but also delivering information to boaters based on where they're going. Um, their interests. We don't have a good way to do that right now. You can't transmit that through an RFID tag. Um, so we're looking, you know, like a passport or the development of an app where people can readily sign on to that. It's voluntary, but through that they consent to uh, having us deliver them pertinent information regarding AIS presence, decontamination locations, all that stuff. Um, so yes, we've definitely looked into it. I think there's there's a lot of value and validity in that, but we are looking in a different direction, mostly because of those reasons I mentioned. Okay, we're gonna shut it down there. Do you have an answer? Okay, real quick. So if you had a question of decontamination. Your question of does decontamination get rid of DNA? And yes, Dr. Cody Youngbull took his DNA tracker to Lake Mead ran um, a sample on a boat that was pre-inspected 
it amplified a lot, and then they ran the tracker on the same boat after decontamination, and they got no amp amplification. Th so. Thanks for that information. Actually, I saw that. Uh, we are hoping to replicate that, except on a much larger scale, because when you're talking about the different types of boats and the range and complexity, we feel like we need to look at probably dozens, if not more boats, to make sure that that's actually the case. But that was the first study of its kind that I know of and a great start. It's promising. Yeah.